Hi, I'm here with Dan Jevons from Shell. Dan is the general manager for data science. And what I wanted to talk to Dan about is how do you become a more data driven company? Um, I have now worked with Shell for a number of years. I helped Shell develop a, a data strategy. And as part of this data strategy, we then identify what does it mean in terms of culture, in terms of skills, in terms of technology and so on. So I thought it would be really useful to share your, your journey yeah. and some maybe some of you, some of the tips you would like to, to share to help other companies go on this data journey. Because I guess it, it might not be immediately apparent that, that data has become a, a hugely important asset for Shell. So yeah, how, how important is data? How much data have you got? <laughs> well, I, I mean, look, I think what's important to recognize is that the oil and gas industry has been a incredibly data intensive industry for a very long time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you look at some of the seismic surveys that we run, they're in the petabyte scale already and haven't yeah. been in that scale for, for quite some years now. Yeah. And so I think what what is important to understand is this is not new for us. Yeah. Yeah. But of course, with the advent of the cloud and a lot of these new technologies emerging, uh, as well as digitalization driving a transformation in society as yeah. a whole, the value of data and the importance of data has gone up a level. Completely. Um, and so what we've been trying to do is think through how do we do that enterprise-wide? Mm. Because we recognize that some of the skills that the cloud-based technology companies have, have developed and the way in which they think of data is quite different to the way that we've thought about it historically. Yeah. And so we want to learn from that. And maybe the first thing, and, and this is also how we started working together, is we were looking to try to make sure we leverage best practice externally and learn from what's going on in the market and mm. bring in that expertise and that mm. thinking. One of the things that's really worked for us is also having a two-speed approach. So it's very easy to think about culture and standards and technologies and trying to get all of that right. But at the same time, you've got to make it matter to the business. Okay. And so what we try to do is think about what are the, we call them MVPs, minimum viable products that are going to have significant business impact immediately. Mm. Um, and also use that to inform the KPIs that really matter to the business. Mm. And then line up to that to say, then which data really matters and how do we invest in things like data quality, data standards, and the technology yeah. to support doing this at scale. Yeah, what I liked about our approach that we took is that actually that we took a step back saying what is actually the, the strategy of the business? How does data become relevant to all of this? How can you use AI to then tackle some of your, your biggest challenges and then look at how, what data you need? So absolutely. And in terms of um, skills then. Skills is a, yeah. is a big challenge for any Absolutely. organization. How do you get the data science skills? How do you yeah. get more of you in, in the business? Um, and and how, how do you keep them? And Yeah, I mean, we've thought about skills at a number of different levels. Um, so I think if you start off, uh, you sort of have the core, right? The, the core, which is data scientists, data engineers, we call them AI engineers as well. Yeah. The people that are going to be spending all their time, all their days dealing with uh, some of the most complex problems that we have yeah. and developing new solutions. Yeah. Uh, for those people, we need to invest in professionalizing uh, what they do. Yeah. And so we work very hard on what we call a discipline, creating uh, something that's aligned to what we do in other parts of the business. So yeah. making data science as important as petrophysics, for example. And so that's something which has been new for us, yeah. but we've worked very hard on that. We've also partnered with Udacity mm -hmm. to develop tailored uh, training programs for those people to develop those skills. Nice. But then you have to go one level out because you also have to deal with what we call the citizen data scientists, the yeah. people who are in the business who are gonna need to be able to develop their own algorithms yeah. or blend the data in new ways yeah. and solve their own problems. Mm -hmm. So we develop what we call the Shell AI community. It's about 2,000 people now across our organization. And those people are learning about what it means to use data in new ways to drive their own business performance. Yeah. Now, I think what's exciting about that is we see real traction there. We mm -hmm. see that people are starting to adopt this at scale. We've got people coming, we get to two, 300 people showing up to every session, learning about what's going on. But we also go to them. So we try and take what we're sharing with them through the community, which is, I guess, a social media community on Yammer, yeah. but we also try and take it to the assets and sit with them, and we call those hackathons. Yeah. So we they bring their data, we bring our expertise, and we work with them to develop small-scale rapid solutions in a very, very short time scale. 
Great example, yeah. And I, I think the you've got those, and then you have a a role that spans the business and the data science community. And that's also super important because one of the things we learned is that it's not just about those skills, but it's also about people who talk to languages. Yeah, exactly. They can talk the language of the business, but they can also talk the language of data science. Mm -hmm. And we've called them business translators. Yeah. And those roles are absolutely crucial in this because yeah. they are the ones who are able to define what the product needs to do that's going to have that business impact. Mm -hmm. And again, we've invested heavily in training those people and also working with them to define ways in which we can translate what they need from a business outcome perspective into a valuable piece of work that a data scientist can do. Mm -hmm. And that the way in which you define metrics around that and business impact is also difficult. It's not straightforward yeah. at all. Yeah, so for, for me, these data translators or business translators are vital roles. Absolutely. And, and it's something that someone is interested in, in if someone is, has some interest in data and AI, but has a really good business background, that's the perfect, perfect job for Absolutely, them. and I think what we find is that these people select themselves, mm. you know, they, they start to emerge from the business with real interest and drive to yeah. start to take some new technology and apply it to their world, mm. and where you get that sort of appetite, that's actually where you get the real bottom line benefits. The other key enabler is obviously technology, you need to make sure, I, I, I think a challenge for most organisations is that you have data silos. Yeah. So as, as part of the data strategy, we then thought it would be nice to have a, a, a layer data lake in place. That's right. Um, what are some of the, the tips, some of the, the best practices around this? Because I, what I like about the approach that Chell is taking is that it's the, the discipline. Yeah. It's not about just dumping everything into That's a data right. lake. Do you want to? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think the, the thing that we've learned is that when you when you start down this road, it's very easy to get tempted uh, to go after the lots of data looking for a problem. problem yeah. Right. So effectively, uh, I've seen so many business requests that actually claim that if you put all the data in one place, the world will be better. Mm. Um, and our experience is, if you put all the data in one place, what you have is more data, and it's harder to sift through and takes more time. Uh, and so, what we've tried to do is be really precise. And, and so let me give you an example of predictive maintenance. What we've done there is we've built a data lake. Now that's now uh, something like 600 billion rows of data that we've aggregated. So it's, it's vast in terms of the data volumes, but it's not any data. It's the data that we need to predict the failures on the assets where we know this is gonna have business benefit. Yeah. So the assets themselves are saying, I have this type of problem. So they decide whether or not compressor failure is something they're interested in. Mm -hmm. If it is, we line them up in a sequence. Mm -hmm. And only when they're actually gonna get a compressor failure algorithm, do we extract the data that we need in order to generate that business outcome. Mm -hmm. And so whilst, yes, we're building a phenomenal data asset, which has probably, to my knowledge, the largest set of curated sensor data on the planet, mm -hmm. at the same time, we're also very focused on saying we're not gonna pull all sensor data, it's only the sensor data which is actually gonna drive the bottom yeah. line business benefit. Perfect, and I, I think this discipline is so important. And, and how do you balance this though with collecting data just in case it might become useful yeah. in the future? This is, this is I, I think, a problem that most companies are yeah. struggling with. And you listen to companies like Google, who say we collect everything yeah. and we never throw away any bit of data. Yeah. As someone that works with businesses, my advice to them is actually the discipline yeah. has to come first. It has to be the 80-20 rule, focus on the, the really strategically important data sets yeah. first. If you then have space and capacity. Well, I think what's interesting is there's a risk to what Google is saying, which is perhaps unforeseen, which is if you think about all the data that you have, Data is both a potential asset, but also a potential liability. I couldn't agree more, yeah. right? Because at the end of the day, data privacy regulation is growing. Also, uh, data sovereignty yeah. is becoming an issue. Mm -hmm. And so for us, one of the things that we're trying to think about is saying, well, look, we're only gonna aggregate and integrate the data that we know has value and that we can actually control. Mm -hmm. Now that has some risk to it, for sure, because you potentially risk not having the data of real value. And sometimes you need to say, we're gonna take the superset rather than the subset, mm -hmm. and that's okay. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you need to be very clear on why you're doing that. What's the benefit you're gonna derive from that? How can you envisage that data being used in the future? Mm -hmm. And also, how are you gonna control access to that data in such a way that you deal with it in a secure, in a reliable, mm -hmm. in a well-managed fashion? Yeah. And also, when somebody gains access to that, 
how do they know what they're looking at? Yeah. Because a lot of the time you get a whole bunch of data, but people don't understand what it's really for. Mm. And so there's a whole raft of things you've got to think about as you go down this journey. And I think that's, what, again, why our work together has been so valuable of trying to think about how do you line up those things? How do you line up the real business impact KPIs mm -hmm. with the data that you're then bringing together? Very good. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed.